Ah, thank you, Lord. Um, the Lord woke me up um, Saturday morning at 3 a.m. Now, how many of you, the Lord wakes you up at that kind of time in the day? See, he used to do that to me all the time, and he doesn't anymore. So if he wakes me up at 3 in the morning, I know something's up. And I woke up hearing his voice. I was in a dead sleep, and I woke up hearing his voice. And here's what I heard. Watch very carefully is I am arranging and rearranging those who are in seats of authority. The shifting will continue until the appointed time causing prognosticators to be incapable, say incapable, of determining what is happening or how things will sift out in the end. Now, and there's more to this I'm going to get to in a second. The world is full of prognosticators. They're trying to adjust the way we think things are moving by their prognostication. If you turn on the TV or the radio and listen to news for more than about 30 seconds, somebody's trying to tell you what to think. If you're on Facebook for very long, how many ads are you seeing? Lord, have mercy. Prognosticators trying to tell you what's happening. But God said, I'm arranging and rearranging, and the shifting will continue until, say, the appointed time. Are we willing to wait for the appointed time? See, we're in a season where we cannot presume to know exactly what it is God's doing. I'm going to say that again. Because it needs to get deep down inside of us. We cannot presume what God is doing right now. And some of what he's doing... When we look at it down the road, we're going to go, well, I didn't see that coming. Can I tell you that's what happened in November of 2020 and in January of 2021? Now, do I believe that there was hanky-panky in the elections? Yes, without a doubt. But here's the deal. I'm not going to worry about that. And I, you're going to hear why in a minute when I read the rest of this word. I don't want us getting caught up in that. If we get caught up in that, we're going to miss the glory. And I'm not willing to miss the glory. We have got to get into a place where we are so intimate with him that we hear what he's saying so that we do in obedience what he's telling us to do. And that includes how you vote. And I'm going to tell you something. Don't jump on any band anybody's bandwagon too quick. Because we don't know. If you look at the slate of candidates in the state of Georgia... Can I just say, we don't know. But I'm going to trust him. Because I'll tell you, some of what I thought a month ago, I don't think anymore. And by next week, I may not think it again. Because it's not about what I think. It's about what is he saying. It's not just the elections, though, folks. It's what's going on at the gas pump. It's what's going on in the economy and with our 401ks. 
Our school. Yeah, I mean, it's the whole thing. Every arena is in a shaking. Have we not heard that? God was going to shake everything that could be shaken so that what remains is of the kingdom. Guess where he's shaking right now? He's shaking us. He's shaking the church. It's being shaken hard. We're being shaken. I'm not pointing fingers. I want you to hear me very, very clearly. I am not pointing fingers. And I'm a little fiery today. <laughs> if you hadn't noticed. All of a sudden I'm kind of like, whoa. So God, shake us. I don't, I don't want something lingering on any of us that's not of the kingdom. Because that's what gets shaken. James 1, 19 through 20, just to set up the rest of this word. I'm reading out of the Amplified. Understand this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Let everyone be quick to hear. Be careful, thoughtful, a careful, thoughtful listener. Slow to speak. A speaker of carefully chosen words. And slow to anger. Patient, reflective, forgiving. For the resentful, deep-seated anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. That standard of behavior which he requires from us. He's dropped a plumb line. I'm just letting that settle. Because a part of what I'm here to do today is to teach us the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is not something you fall into. All the way through scripture you see the fear of the Lord is taught. And the church has not taught the fear of the Lord. We've been too familiar. We've been too complacent. Now, this is not to put us into such a sobriety that we don't understand how to enjoy the Lord. It's actually so that we can enjoy Him properly. Because when you have a proper fear of the Lord that He is God and we are not, then you can enter into a celebration that is unrestrained. And you'll have victory over the devil. If you don't have, a, have the fear of the Lord on you and you try to go after a demon, you're not going to get very far. So if you're in some battles and you're going, I'm getting beat, ask the Lord to teach you the fear of the Lord in a new measure. Now, I had never thought that until that second, so I know that was for somebody. Psalm 34, 11 through 14 says, Come, you children, listen to me, and I will teach you to fear the Lord with awe inspiring reverence and worship him with obedience. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Anybody like that in here? We desire and we love many days that we may see good. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from st speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. That's Psalm 34, 11 through 14. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. Therefore, you shall choose life. Say, I shall, I shall. choose life in order that you may live, you 
and your descendants. Hallelujah. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those, and I'm going to say, the tongue that we speak with and the fingers that we type with. I'm meddling, I know. Because that's the sound of our voice on social media. I want you to hear me and hear me very, very carefully. The sound of our voice is being heard on social media. Your voice is being heard. You're going to see why I'm so serious about this in a minute. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it and indulge it will eat its fruit and bear the consequences of their words. What fruit do you want? What consequences do you want to live in? I know this is heavy. It doesn't feel good, but I'm not going to apologize. It didn't feel good up, up here either. I'm just going to say. Thank you, Father. Proverbs 8, 14 through 16. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding, power, and strength are mine. By me, kings reign and rulers decide and decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles, all who judge and govern rightly. Counsel and wisdom of the Lord's. But by me, king, say I'm a king, by the blood of Jesus. So by, by Jesus, I reign, I rule, and I decree. Job twenty two twenty eight amplified. You will also decide and decree a thing, and it will be established for you, and the light of God's favor will shine upon your way. What you decree determines the path that's in front of you. Now, if we decree according to heaven, your path is going to be light. If we decree according to the wisdom of the earth, which is demonic and sensual and full of every evil thing, guess what the path in front of you is going to be like? Therefore, choose life. Choose life. And we have to be like Micaiah in 2 Chronicles 18, 13. But Micaiah said, as the Lord lives, I will only speak what my God says. I will only speak what my God says. And I'm just going to propose to us that perhaps we need to be listening a whole lot more than we're talking. Now, see, we're in a decade of the mouth, so we're supposed to be speaking, right? So I'm not telling us to be quiet. I'm telling us to be careful. Because if we're just talking and we're not saying what heaven is saying, then what happens with our words is they sow things that don't need to be sown into the earth. And oftentimes what happens when we're just speaking words that we think we've heard God say, but God hasn't said, or God said, but God didn't tell you to speak. How many of you know God speaks some things to us that we need to keep to ourselves and keep praying and not speak it? 
Because sometimes what we hear, we interpret in the moment based on our history rather than being based on the Word of God. I had somebody call me about a week ago or a little more, and they'd had a dream, and in the dream, they said they heard God say that the window had closed over America. God said that to Nineveh, and Nineveh repented, and revival came. Right? Second Chronicles 7, 14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will turn and I will do what? Heal their land. They'll forgive and heal. Sounds like even if a window is closed, there's a pathway of hope. Because God is a God of redemption. God is a God of restoration. He's a God of reconciliation. He is always pursuing life. Because he is life. So we have to watch what we're saying. Are we agreeing with what heaven's desire is? Are we agreeing with our, what our subconscious fears are saying? Are even our subconscious belief systems such as it's just going to get worse and worse and worse and then we're, you know, the end's going to come. Can I just tell you, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Because the last time I read the Word of God... This morning, a minute ago, Christ is returning for a bride that is mature, that is like him, that is pure and spotless and undefiled. We're not there yet. Now, we're looking better. Can you say we're looking better? But we're not there yet. Because if we're going to, if Christ is coming back for a body, a bride that is like him, we're going to be doing the things that he did in greater still because that's what the word of God says. Because this isn't just about us being holy by a religious standard. It's about us living according to the holy that he says we are already. Okay, I'm letting that one settle in on you because some of you are looking at me like, well, I'm not very holy. I'm not asking about your behavior. We can do that. I'm talking about your identity. By the blood of Jesus, you have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, right? Therefore, you are holy even as he is holy, and you are to then be holy. But you will never be holy in your action until you understand that you are holy. Right? Is that making sense? See, we get caught up here in our head, and the devil is really good at telling us everything we did wrong. And our flesh is really good at telling us everything we've done wrong. And I'm not excusing any of that. But do you know what you do with that? When the devil comes up and tells you, you had a really stinky attitude. Are you da-da-da-da, whatever, fill in your blank. When that comes up, Thank you for reminding me of what I did because now, Father, forgive me. The devil just became an instrument to lead you to repentance. Turn it back on him. 
I mean, why do we let him put us into condemnation that if he reminds us of our past, remind him of his future, but if you haven't repented of something, then repent. We make this so complicated. It's really not very complicated. Jesus says, turn, come to me, agree with what I say about you. Do you know what he says about you? You're his beloved. You're beautiful. You're my beloved son and daughter. You are accepted in the beloved. You are clothed in robes of righteousness and you are crowned with glory. You're not the tail, you're the head. You're not broken and wounded, I've restored you and made you whole. See, we tend to rehearse all the broken things. Will you start rehearsing the redeemed? Because that's who you are. Say, I am the redeemed. By the blood of Jesus, I have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am the head and not the tail. I am a conqueror. I am more than victorious. And I am filled with glory. Because Holy Spirit dwells in me. I've been washed and made clean. And there is therefore no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus. And I am in him. And he is in me. In Jesus' name. What would happen if you did that several times a day? It will change the way you think. That really is the issue. And if you change the way you think, it's changing your heart. Because as a heart thinketh. It speaks. So if we're trying to get some, a watch over our lips, right? The issue isn't our tongue as much as it is our heart. And it's what we're thinking about. It's how we're thinking. And if we're thinking out of the flesh in anger and resentment and bitterness and they did this. That's what's going to come out of you. And God's saying, that's not the way I want my people to talk. Because, you know, a lot of what's going on in the world right now, a lot of people are being used as pawns of the enemy. And God doesn't want us playing on their playing field. we got to come to a higher level. And he's telling us to watch carefully. So the word when I got up and began writing continued. Ecclesia. Say, that's us. And you notice I said us. Not I. Because ecclesia is corporate. Body of Christ is corporate. Church is corporate. We are members of the church. Irritates me really bad when somebody tells me I am the church. No. You're a part. Hear me. We've got to get our theology right. This is basic. And most of the church is off on this. Letting that one settle in. I can feel it kind of rippling across the room. Ecclesia, watch your mouth. I don't know if God talks to you that way. He talks to me that way. Ecclesia, watch your mouth and be very, very careful how you speak in these days. 
Remember the importance of your words to fuel and set the course for the future. Say, my words have the power to set the course of my future. My words have the power to set the course for this nation. Serious. Be very careful how you speak of the men and women in the races for office in this hour. I'm going to say that one again. Be very, very careful how you speak of the men and women in the races for office in this hour. We are to be people that bless and don't curse. People who speak life and not death. So be very, very careful. I'm going to continue. For by your words, this is serious, folks. For by your words, even those that I have chosen can be displaced and hindered from moving into position. Be very, very careful how you speak of the men and women in the races for office in this hour. For by your words, even those I have chosen can be displaced and hindered from moving into position. Again, I'm just letting, these are God's words, these aren't mine. I wrote it exactly like I heard it. I don't want my words to hinder what I'm not rightly discerning. Because didn't he say, I'm doing stuff that until the appointed time you won't see? This is the second time he's given me this type word. How many of you remember the word about the multi-tiered chessboard? It had the same message in it. You don't know what you don't know. But there's a greater weight on this one for me. Your words empower angelic movement and are also capable of fueling demonic activity. Speak what I say and remain in agreement with what I have said regardless of what it looks like. Do not fret and moan, stagger or waver. Because here's the deal about our humanity. Is that when we hear certain reports, we can be shifted and move away from what God said. Right? God has some people chosen. I know that. But the deal is, he hasn't really told us. And even if he had, now I want you to hear me, <laughs> even if he had, if we don't align with him, it won't happen. I believe with everything in me, God had chosen President Trump to be in office for another four years. But just because God has prophesied something doesn't mean it is a guaranteed. Because we have to align and we have to do the work that is necessary to move into the prophetic word that God has said. 
If I had not agreed with what God said over me in 1994, that he called me to be a wise master builder and to submit myself to all of those years. Do you hear how many years that is? Of preparation and process, I would not be doing what I'm doing now. I could have... I could have negated God's word by me not pursuing and doing what he said do. I could have chosen to go an easier pathway. Let me just say that. Because let me tell you something. Being a woman, an apostle in Atlanta is not an easy thing. And people had to agree with what God was saying. Right? There had to be some people along the way that agreed, affirmed, came into an alignment, brought me into an alignment, but also came into an alignment with what heaven was saying for the reality to become manifest. Part of what happened in the last election, I'm only going to go here for a minute, but I feel like it needs to be addressed. Part of what happened in the last election is, yeah, there was, there was fraud. But do you know what the bigger issue was? As a whole bunch of the church started speaking against the man of God, the man that God had chosen, whether he's a man of God or not, God had chosen, because God used Cyrus. I mean, come on. We're trying to get somebody elected that looks like a pastor when we needed a Jehu. I wasn't looking for somebody to make me feel good. But a whole lot of the church began cursing who God had chosen. That gave the enemy legal access to mess with our elections. I want you to hear what I just said. We got to watch what we speak. And a whole lot of the church didn't want to vote for him because he put out mean tweets. I mean, seriously? Do you not have any tougher skin than that? Get over yourself. I'm sorry. Ugh. But I am not willing, not in this house, or whoever is watching me online, and I may get pulled from everything on this one, and I really don't care just where I am. I'm not willing... For us to not watch our words carefully. Your words empower angelic movement and also are capable of fueling demonic activity. Speak what I say and remain in agreement with what I have said regardless of what it looks like. Do not fret. Look at yourself. Say, I'm not going to fret anymore. I'm not going to moan, I'm not going to stagger, and I'm not going to waver. And he says, trust me and speak in agreement with what I am saying. So what are we to speak? God has said, America shall be saved. So what can you speak over our elections? God said... America shall be saved. If you don't have anything beyond that, that's a great declaration. God said that the greatest days of church history are not in our past, they're in our present and they are in our future. The greatest awakening the world has ever seen is in our future. It is coming, it is birthing even now. That's what you can decree. And let me tell you something. 
If that is true, and I believe with every fiber of my being that it is, because when I was 18 years old in 1975, I was in a Baptist student union gathering in Ridgecrest, North Carolina, not filled with the Holy Spirit, and God gave me a, an open vision. In that open vision, I was standing on a platform holding a microphone. I thought, well, that meant, because I was a Baptist and women didn't do stuff. And I was a singer, so I figured I would be singing for, before an evangelist in a week or two revivals around wherever, which I was already doing. And as I stood there and saw this vision of me on a platform, the letters revival dropped on top of my head. R. E V I V A L. I know God's doing it. When I stood on a hill in, in Ireland, God said, What I did in Patrick's day, I'll do again. I'm going to do it in your day, and you'll not only see it, you'll be a part of it. So I am convinced with every fiber of my being because that revival in Ireland turned a nation around in a day. From gross paganism to the nation that sent missionaries out across the world that transformed the nations of the world. Signs, wonders, miracles, power encounters, changed government, became the source of education, became the source of arts and all kinds of creative. They were the birthplace. You hear what I'm saying? God said he's doing it again and I'd be a part of it. So that means you're in it too. So if you can't decree anything else, decree that. Decree what you know God's saying. America's not laws. God said. <laughs> I have a remnant. And I made a covenant with this land. And this isn't about this land, it's about his covenant. And from these shores, men and women will go out to, to this nation and to other nations to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. Cape Henry. Then you have the Mayflower Compact. Yeah, do we have some mess in our history? Without a doubt. We had African-American slaves, the African slaves. But you know, we also had Irish slaves, and we had Chinese slaves, and we had Japanese slaves. We had all kinds of slaves. That's atrocious. But do you know what? The blood of Jesus is more than enough. Yes. And we, every other nation, exactly. We're not unique in that. The unique thing about the United States of America is that there's a people. It's a remnant. It says, God, forgive us for we sinned against you and to look at each other and say, can we walk together? Can we live out the original intention that was for us to be a people that walk together in love and honor, a manifestation of what it looks like around the throne. People from every tongue and every tribe and every nation worshiping the king of glory, not caught up in our own flesh and our own self-consciousness, but caught up with him. Forgiving one another, living in love and harmony. Being carriers of the glory. Do you know one of the things that thrills me most about coming here and looking around this room? Is that we're a representation of people from many tongues and tribes and nations. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. That's what heaven's like. 
And we're supposed to be bringing heaven to earth. And we're doing this in authenticity. We're not doing this in a form. We're walking together. It's a real gift that God's given us. I don't take credit for it. We've just said yes. Trust me and speak in agreement with what I am saying. Listen to this and listen carefully. Do you not know that I am more than able? Say, he's more than able. To deal with voting machines, mules, and every other method of madness that could be set in motion to rig and fix an election. Do you not know God's big enough? So, Ecclesia, be very, very careful what you say. We're either fueling demonic forces that can continue to do their ridiculous mayhem or we're, deli we're agreeing with heaven and empowering the angels to do what God has said he wants to do. He wants to turn our schools around. He wants to turn our government around. He wants to break the back of corruption in the church. Yeah. See, I can't, I can't even go deal with corruption in the, in the state yet because i got to deal with the corruption in the church. With the Saul's and the Eli's and the sons of Eli. To use Kim Malone's word with the Mamby Pambies who don't have the guts to speak truth. It came up this weekend. I looked at somebody. I, got, I, I looked at them and I said, well, I guess they need a few more firebrand women. <laughs> Just saying. Because you won't find this in many pulpits. And I'm just... I, have all, I put it all on the line anyway. So why not, right? The Lord said this. Speak what I say and watch me. Watch me confound the enemy and set the righteous in places of authority and influence, even in spite of the schemes and diabolical plottings of nefarious men and women. Watch me and see. He can do it. Remember, nothing is impossible. And yes, I can turn a nation in a day. But remember, I need your voice to unwaveringly agree with heaven. Do this and watch me perform the miraculous and show the nations who I and my ecclesia truly are. I know God's doing this. But I have... Y'all good on time? Y'all good for a minute? Um... As American Christians, we have wanted to decree a thing and see it manifested immediately and everything peace, be peaceful and calm. Right? Because we don't like a fight. Can I tell you, we need to have a rebirthing of a pioneering spirit. We need to have a rebirthing of a boldness and a courage that is willing to fight for the freedom that others fought for. 
We've got to have a spirit on the inside of us that's not afraid of a protest. I don't like what I'm about to say, but I got to say it. We have to be a people that are bold, courageous, tenacious, and unwavering in our devotion to our king. That when riots break out, we don't shrink back. Because I'm telling you, they've already started. And I'm going to deliver the rest, this next part, by reading from a word Clay Nash got on Friday. I got my word on Saturday early morning. He got his on Friday early morning. Clay writes, when I awoke early this morning, the Lord said, the win, W-I-N, of the war will begin Monday. But he also said to me, the intensity of the battle, many are not prepared for. And I feel, I feel that rumbling through the room. The win, W-I-N, of the, of the war will begin Monday. And Jane Hammond came forth and delivered the same thing later. And then I found out that there's at least some uh, thinking that they may release the answer to the Dobbs case on Monday. And if we think that the attendants to the altar of Molech are going to roll over without a fight, we're wrong. Jane said, I think it was Friday night, cities will be burning. In the name of Jesus, I bind up all fear. I bind it up right now. No fear. I'm, I am here to prepare us. Okay? I believe we can abate some of it by our intercession. My gut level discernment is we're not going to stop all of it. I saw Atlanta on fire in the spirit. Now I'm saying, God, have mercy. Give us strategies on how to pray. But I'm here as your leader to say, be careful what you say. Don't let fear take you. Just like with the virus, fear was the entrance that took many out. I'm not going to say that was the deal across the board, but it really was a lot. Okay, you hearing me? The church has gotten so soft that we, we, don't, we don't like spiritual warfare, much less the thought of any other kind. And we've got to press into the Lord for a greater strength. I find it interesting over the last, this is now our fourth week in a row. At four Sundays ago, we had Tim Carskaden in here. Basically telling us the same thing. Different ways, but the same thing. The next week, we had Katie Souza. And Francis Miles in, and they told us what? The same thing. 
Last week we had Ann Tate in, and she told us what? Same thing, different words. I want you to be so secure in Christ and in who he is in you and who you are in him that you don't waver and that your mouth doesn't agree with hell, but it agrees with heaven. And we're going to have to watch. And I want you to give the people around you permission. You trust me, right? Give the people around you permission to say, wait a minute, I think you need to rethink that. Rethink what you're saying. Rethink how you're saying that. Because sometimes what we're saying may be facts, but it's not truth out of heaven. Because if it does not align with the character, nature, and authority of Christ, we don't need to be saying it right now. Pour out your complaints before the Lord. I mean, go before him, pour it all out, tell him all the stuff you're thinking. He knows anyway. Right? He knows. So if you've got fear, you've got consternation, you've got some anger, say, Lord, I'm confessing to you. i got some anger going on here. I'm really tired of this mess over here. And say, God, help me deal with this. I don't want you going into denial. I want you to be strengthened in your soul so that the anger can be brought into a proper position so then it becomes fuel for righteousness, not for hell. Okay, if I talk to y'all that way. Because I am. We got to have a chuckle in here every once in a while. One of the other things Clay said in this word is we've got to get diplomacy out of the church. Diplomacy is compromise. It is. It's just compromise. We, we don't want to say something or get somebody upset. I could have probably given this message in a little bit more diplomatic way. But why? Because then you'd have to try to figure out what I was saying. I don't think you have a question today. we got to get out of this trying to make everybody feel good. My job is not to make you come in, come to a church service, get your vitamin B12 to feel good, and then go home and go see the news and go, <gasps> and not be prepared. Because a B12 shot wears off. Nothing wrong with them, but they wear off, right? I want you strengthened in your innermost being through your attending to the altar of the Lord. Through your rehearsing, what has God said? Because see, as long as you're walking in obedience to what God has said, the devil can't mess with you too much. He can, he can give you, you know, bat you around a little bit and try to. But I have this philosophy, when he comes and messes with me, I'm going to mess with him. And I win. Because I am more than, uh, more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus my Lord. And he, he doesn't win. And here's the deal. I've seen eternity. And if I die, guess what? Now, I'm not looking to anytime soon. I've got a lot to do. So as long as I'm being in a obedience to what God's called me to do, I'm walking in a place of obedience and a place of immunity. Look at Psalm 91. Sheltered under the wings. When you start feeling yourself wobbly, Pull in, nestle up underneath the wings of the Almighty. 
pull aside. Pull aside. Let him strengthen you in your innermost being. We've got to have battle strength. We've got to have battle strength, folks. We're not going to do this on our own. We're part of a company of people. And we're not even alone right here. We're a part of a growing ecclesia that's being strengthened in their innermost being by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the fullness of the Word of God. Because we've seen what it is God's doing and what He wants to do. And I choose to agree with heaven. The greatest days of church history are not in our past. They're in our present and in our future. The greatest awakening the world has ever seen is upon us. In the midst of chaos and gross darkness, the light of the Lord is shining. And people that have been held captive for years are suddenly out of the chaos coming home. The pressures that the enemy's putting on this nation right now is going to cause a lot of people to go, I don't know what to do. But I heard somebody talk about a man named Jesus. I heard somebody talk about a man named Jesus. I saw my neighbor, and they're going through the same thing I am. They're not wavering. They got a glow on their face. They've been somewhere I haven't been before. I'll close with this. We were in one of the services in Houston. The Lord took me back to an encounter I had with him years ago. Because for years I taught the tabernacle of Moses of coming from the outer court in past the bronze altar and the brazen laver and into the holy place. And you've got the lamp, which is the Holy Spirit. You've got the table of showbread and you've got the altar of incense. As you've got the Holy Spirit shining light over on the word of God. You take it, you eat it, it's sprinkled with frankincense. It's got a bitterness to the taste, but it's life to the soul. And you offer up your worship and your intercession. It goes in before you into the Holy of Holies because the middle wall of division has been rent. And what I saw is the Lord saying, I am inviting my people not moving this way, but moving this way. Because see, it, it's the Holy Spirit, the word of God in our worship that takes us through the demonic realm of the second heaven. That's what carries you through. When you get into that place of the Holy of Holies, where God sits enthroned in glory, all through this part, on the, in the outer court with the bronze, the bronze laver, I mean the bronze altar, the brazen laver, even in the holy place with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and our worship and our prayers, we're talking. When we get into that other place, he talks. We're silent. We're listening. He's infusing us with glory. He's infusing us with wisdom and revelation, knowledge, mind, counsel, and the fear of the Lord. He is saturating us with himself. So when we come out of that place... You're carrying glory. You're carrying glory. When you walk into a place that's in darkness and you're carrying glory, you change the atmosphere. God's calling us to be a people that change the atmosphere. 
See, he's not looking for how smart we are. Praise God. He's looking for a people that will stay in his presence. Let him saturate us with glory and then send us out so that wherever you go, all somebody has to do is get next to you and bump into you and glory gets them. Because out of glory, somebody says something to you, you have an answer. And it's not out of here, it's out of him. When chaos happens around you, you don't react, you respond. We have to shift into being a people who respond, not react. The only way we respond is if we're living in the strength of Holy Spirit. How many of you want to live there? It's an open door. How many of you are willing to invite the Lord to set an angel watch over your mouth and a guard over your lips? including your typing on the social media that you may not sin against him. God's taking us into a place so that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart are acceptable in his sight and that our words, when we're making declarations and decrees, when we're speaking to one another, that what we're doing is we're empowering the angels that are assigned to us to do his bidding.